we're gonna be in a new conversation here for the next couple of months about family, about, um, about all aspects of family, really, about marriage, about kids, relationships, um, and God's original design, original intent for all of these things. Because I don't know if you've uh, paid attention lately, but uh, uh, the, our, most cultures around the world have a different idea about all these things and what the Bible originally intended, what God originally intended. And so we're gonna, we're gonna dive into this and uh, we are gonna be talking about some sensitive things. And I need you to um, understand my heart as a pastor. I hope, um, I hope you know that I'm for you, I'm, I'm for your family, I'm for your kids, I'm for your neighbors, I'm for the people you don't like. Um, but my heart also is God's design is the absolute best for your life, period. It just is. And this is not bully with a stick. This is just us. We're gonna look into God's word and see how it frames it for us. And hopefully, hopefully be able to lean into this in a way that we, that we all can, can grab hold of it because what has happened is Satan has made something extremely beautiful, just unnecessarily complicated and difficult. And, um, and we can just clear the air. Would that be easy? And we're gonna go in right from the beginning, right back to Genesis and figure out how God started the whole thing. So I think maybe today's conversation hopefully will open your eyes to a couple things. We've heard terms over the last 50 years, like feminist, misogynist, male domination and privilege. We've heard all these things. And I could tell you neither of those things were God's design. They weren't. So we're gonna look in Genesis, when God created us, when God created us, I should preface that I believe we were created by the hand of God on purpose. And we're gonna start there. Genesis chapter two, verse 18. Why don't you stand your feet in honor of the word? Amen. Genesis chapter two, we'll read eight, verses 18 through 24. This is the long explanation God gives uh, about how he created male and female. All right, Genesis chapter two, verse 18. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. And out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh and the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man and he never got a good night's rest after that. Uh, sorry, I don't, those are, maybe those are my notes. I, don't, I didn't mean to read that part. That was a joke, verse 23. Then the man said, this is, this at last, listen to the anticipation, listen to the excitement in his voice. This at last is bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. Father, we thank you for your word to us today. Lord, Lord, we just pray that we'd, we'd feel the Holy Spirit drawing us back to your design not as a restriction, Lord, but as freedom. Lord, that you pull us back into your arms so that we could experience, God, what you intended for us to experience, the fullness, the love, the freedom that comes 
in this original relationship that you put together. Lord, let us know that today. God, we thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray, everyone said. Amen. You may be seated. Up to this point in the creation story, everything that God created was good. Matter of fact, it said, and the Lord looked at it and said it was good. Every stage along the way, it's good, it's good, it's good. You can go back and read the first chapter of Exodus and you find out that what God was speaking into existence was good. He creates Adam and it gives Adam a job. Adam's naming all the animals, and at some point in time, God makes the observation that it wasn't good for Adam to be alone. Now, there's been a ton of jokes about that, you know, that, that man can't live by himself and all, you know, you've heard them all. I don't think that's what God was saying. We need to be really careful with Genesis chapter two because if we read it without the right perspective, we, might, we may be tempted to think that God made a mistake right off the jump. He, he says, it is good, it is good. He, he speaks light into existence. He separates the heavens from the earth. He creates the earth. He, he creates all the animals in it and all the, all the plants. It's a beautiful creation. He makes man. And if we read it, in the wrong way, we think, oh, he forgot something. Like he just put the man out there by himself. And then if you read, if you come at it from a modern perspective, the man was so stupid, he couldn't figure it all out anyway. None of those things were true. God did not make a mistake. God did not leave something out. God's will is perfect and intentional. And there was, no, there was no resistance to his will at this time. He was speaking in things into existence and they were happening. So there's no chance that God all of a sudden went, whoa, I forgot, he's by himself. What is being recorded here is for you and me. Adam is naming all the animals, they're, they're coming around, I don't know how he's doing it, I don't know if he's walking, and just looking at things and going, yeah, that's a bird, that's a whatever. And through his interactions with these other parts of creation, he's noticing things. He's noticing that there are birds that are just a little bit different. He's noticing that there are things that are made just a little bit different. They're the same species, but made just a little bit different from each other and how they're interacting with each other. And Adam realizes that he doesn't have that same interaction. He is interacting with God, but not another person. Is it possible that God put Adam in this circumstance by his divine will to show him that he needed help? To introduce the idea not that there was a mistake made, I can actually put my kids in circumstances on purpose to show them what they need next. True? So the issue is this, God wasn't trying to show Adam necessarily that he wasn't enough for him, that he wasn't, he, he wasn't perfect. He was showing him that in order to accomplish God's will, he would need what Genesis calls a helper, a helper. Look at your neighbor and say, we need help, a helper. Now, now, man, all the men look at me right here. All the men look at me right here. Look up at me, look up at me. If you ask for help, it doesn't mean you're weak. True, I know it feels like that sometimes and I know I know that it's like, oh, I don't need, I'm a grown man. The older I get, the more I realize the fastest way to get where you want to go is to ask for help. Listen, guys, 
I tell the staff all the time, the fastest way for you to figure it out is to pick up the phone. If there's nobody in this building that knows, you better pick up the phone. Because if you spend four days figuring out yourself, that's not smart. The fastest way to get to it is to call somebody that already knows. You know why I say that? Because people will sit on Google for a year. Like, well, I'm researching it. I'm trying to figure it out myself. Yeah, and I'm paying you to sit on Google when the answer is a phone call away. 30 seconds, you could be in touch with somebody. Look at your neighbor and say, we, we all need a little help. Tell them. But men, listen, I want you to understand this right now. God did not tell Adam he needed a helper because he messed up with him. The simple fact is God's will for Adam was bigger than what he could accomplish within himself. Oh, this is important for people like me because, because I like people to a certain extent. Anybody else in the room like that? I like people to a certain extent and then you're just a problem. Let's just, let's just be honest. How many people, I know some of you are like, just put a lot of people around me, I feel all warm and fuzzy. I don't, I get a rash. <laughs> so, like, I like working with people, I like, but when it comes down to it, I'm like, get out of the way, man, you're just making things complicated. Right from the beginning, God said, I'm not gonna let you do this by yourself. It's not my will that you would be by yourself. Now, I need you to understand this in a broad term. Because some of you are sitting in here, you're not married right now, you may never get married, and I'm not telling you you should get married. Some of you shouldn't get married. Some of you shouldn't get married again. S like, I'm just letting you know, some people should stay, so that's fine. But God doesn't leave you by yourself because then we get in the New Testament, he calls it the body of Christ. So you're still not allowed to just run off on your own and live in the woods. He, every time God tells us to do something, he puts us in community. All the way back to the beginning and even now in the church. In 2024, he says, you're the body of Christ. Each of you have been given gifts that, that benefit somebody else. So he creates us differently now with different giftings so that we, when we come together, when we operate the right way, we're a benefit to each other. So from Genesis all the way to now, God's still telling the same story. And now he shows it in the marriage relationship. But that doesn't mean that if you're not married, you're not in God's will. It means if you're not in community, you're not in God's will. Did you pick up on that? So all the way back at the beginning, he establishes this. And he says, hey, I'm just letting everybody know it's not good for him to be here by himself. And what I've asked him to do is bigger than just what he can do by himself. God did not create us asexual. He didn't create us to be able to reproduce on our own. It was God's intent from the beginning for humans to reproduce and have dominion over the earth. Amen? And so he, he makes the statement out loud. He's not saying there's a deficiency in Adam. He's not saying Adam wasn't created perfect, but he said, he, what he's saying is my will is bigger than what Adam can accomplish by himself. So what does he do? So God created man in his own image and the image of God had created him, male and female, he created him. So what happens is God says, I'm gonna give you a helper. Now, we have denigrated the term helper to the point that, that it means somebody less. This, this, started, um, this started, this whole philosophy of things, in the 1960s, some of you were there, some of you participated. We had a thing, little thing called the sexual revolution. That was probably one of the worst revolutions in modern history. Because what it did is it says, this was God intent for us and we will throw the whole thing out the window and give ourselves permission to do whatever we want. That was the late 1960s. 
Now fast forward to 2024, we're reaping the results of doing whatever you want, whenever you want to do it. That's where we are as a country. That's where we are as a culture. We can look at other cultures and see how they went there 10, 20, 30, 40 years before we did. And they just did whatever they wanted and the culture disintegrated. Birth rates go down. Marriage rates go down. Anxiety goes up, depression goes up, all the other things goes up, violence goes up. We'll talk about all this. So in the late 1960s, we went, that's prudish. We don't wanna do that anymore. We've heard, we heard about that. We've heard about that forever. We don't wanna do that anymore. We want to do whatever we feel like doing. And we did as a country, and we are as a country doing whatever we want to do. But we've forgotten this one important thing that Genesis 127 tells us. So God created man in his, help me out, own image. Now this is a separating factor in creation because no other animal, no other part of creation was given this distinction. There was, it wasn't a bird, it wasn't a, it, it wasn't a, a fish, it wasn't a bear. No other animal was given the distinction of being created in the image of God. God stops and says, let us make man in our own image. And we believe this is the triune God, the God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit is saying, we're gonna make man in our own image. There's things that you can do that no other animal on the planet can do. You know why? Because you're created in the image of God. You can reason. Now I know, I've watched the documentaries. Black crows are really smart. Yeah, they can pick up a rock and bust open a seed with it. Wow. A crow's never made a computer. A crow's never fell in love. At least not to my knowledge. You were created with the innate ability to do things that nothing else on the planet could do. You were created to have dominion. That's a godlike feature. You were created to have dominion over all the animals, over all the earth. You were created to have dominion, not to be subject to the earth or animals, but to have dominion over it. That's in the image of God. You were created with emotions. That's in the image of God. You were created, you were created with the ability to reason. That's, within the, that's the image of God. You were created with the ability to forgive. And you were created with the ability to take out wrath. All of these things. God says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something now that, I'm, that I've, I've done, not done up to this point. And I'm going to create mankind in the image of me. We were elevated. No matter what you hear today, mankind was elevated above all creation in stature and in intellect in relation to the creator. Our purpose was different. Our interactions with God were different. Our abilities were different. And we were called to be fruitful and multiply and have dominion over the earth. Say amen. All right, now here's what happened. Way before the sexual revolution, we have this little thing called evolution that popped up. And I know, I know, it's deemed as fact today. And I don't mind, I don't mind, um, some aspects of evolution, if I'm honest with you, I don't mind a dog, you know, having different ears and, um, you know, I don't care about that. But as soon as we say that you and I were just a random series of cell mutations and splits and, and all these things, guess what we lose? We lose the value of human life. We, we lose we lose the uniqueness of being a human. We lose, we lose the interaction with God. There's not an intentionality anymore. It's just we're here and what's the point? And what the Bible says is all the way back to the beginning, God said, I'm gonna do something unique I haven't done before. Yes, I created the heavens and the earth. Yes, I created all the animals and the plants, but now I'm getting ready to bark on something unlike anything else. And I'm gonna have a relationship with mankind. I'm gonna, 
I'm going to have a purpose and a plan. And, and when we reduce that, we do it at our own peril. The acceptance of evolution as scientific fact has reduced man to the lowest form on the planet. We're no different than anything else. And when those things happen, the value of life decreases. And so we can determine things through abortion and violence. And if we're honest, we turn on the TV and we just expect it now. We expect violence. It's part of our culture. It's part of what happens and and, and, and it's an accepted thing now. We're getting more violent, more violent, and more violent. And the truth is, we've been conned into the idea that life is not worth it. We've been conned into the idea that, that life is not unique to humans. We're, we're conned into the idea that, that, a, that a life isn't valuable in the, in the eyes of God. So this happens after the fall of mankind, after Adam and Eve's sin, we see God make this statement. This is actually a good while. This was Noah. After the flood, God reminds Noah of the importance of life. Now remember, God saved humanity through Noah and his sons and, and daughter-in-laws, and they, he puts them in the ark, the, the whole planet floods, and he's reestablishing mankind through Noah's lineage. But he tells him in Genesis chapter nine, verse six, whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. He's like, no, you can't let this ha continue to happen. I just wiped out the planet to save it and I'm telling you, you can't let it happen. Now, did you read why? Be for God made man in his own image. You can't just take a life. You can't just be haphazard with this. No, he's like, this is important. I created humans and I didn't, I didn't want you just to take each other's life. That's not my plan for you. And the reason he gives it is because we're different. Did you notice God didn't say to Noah, hey, I'm sick of you killing the birds, man. He didn't say that. He didn't say, I'm, I'm tired of you eating all the plants. I'm tired of you hunting. He didn't say any of that. He said, I'm really worn out with you killing each other. You, Noah, you've devalued life. And it's not the same as all the other things. You were made in my image. So you say, Chris, why are you harping on this so much? Because the more we devalue life, the more we entitle ourselves to do whatever we want. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if I hurt you. It doesn't matter if you hurt me because we're just, after all, what, who cares? Who cares? We're no, different than the, we're no different than the animals. We're just, you know, doing our thing for while we're here. But I'm telling you that that's not true about you or the person you're sitting beside. It's not true. It's not true. If you wake up tomorrow with the deep-seated idea that God created me on purpose and he has a will and a plan for me to accomplish while I'm here, that changes how you treat yourself and how you treat the people around you. Come on, can, I, can, I, can you help me out a little bit? It changes it. Now I'm valuing my life and I'm valuing the lives of the people around me, amen? Maybe you won't cuss somebody out in front of Lowe's next week when they cut you off. <laughs> because even though they cut you off, they were made in the image of God. You're like, we'll see. <laughs> now listen, male and females were made in the image of God. Look at your neighbor and say, all of us were made in the image of God. We gotta get that down, tell them. We're made in the image of God. We're made in the image of God, made in the image of God. Made in the image of God. You're, I don't care where your parents came from. I don't care how you grew up. Doesn't matter. You were made in the image of God. Now let's talk about how he made us. Genesis 2, 18. Then the Lord God said, it is not good for that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. 
So man was created first. Can we all understand that? All right, man was created first. He's given a job. Adam, I'm gonna, I'm gonna round some animals up. I want you to name them. And whatever you name them, I'm cool with. And that might've been God's first mistake. I don't know. But <laughs> Adam's like dog one, dog two, dog three. I don't know. So what happens is he, um, what we said before, he starts figuring out that there's nothing suitable in creation at this point in time for him. This is not a mistake from God. This is God showing Adam that he can't fulfill his purpose alone. And so if you, if you will understand this in your life, if you will deeply understand this in your life, when you get in circumstances where you're trying to isolate yourself, it, where, where, you are, where you are isolating yourself from other people, that is not God pushing you into isolation. God is trying to, God wants you to understand that in isolation, you can't accomplish everything he wants you to do. That's why isolation doesn't feel good after a while. That's why we do bad things in isolation. That's why we sin more in isolation. Come on, amen? So he, he says, hey, this isn't, this isn't what I wanna see you do, Adam, and I wanted to make a point that this is not good for you. So now I'm gonna create you a helper. So now we got, the, now we got a problem. Because, because on our modern day translation of this, now Adam gets a house cleaner. That's what we've been told. That's what we've been told. He's, he's got somebody to do the dishes and have the babies. And, and male domination starts a creation and it's a nasty thing and we should reject the whole thing. Well, can I just tell you this morning that that's Satan translating the Bible for you. That's Satan translating the Bible for you. If you've heard the, the, this feminist thing about, no, 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 well, I'm not a helper. You, you have categorically misunderstood and misrepresented scripture. Because he made both of them in his image. Amen? Adam is made first. Order does not equal importance. Okay, can I explain it another way? Um, okay. Which one is more important to you, your first child or your third child? I, I just, I mean, come on. I mean, I know you have a favorite. <laughs> which one? Come on, mom, which one? Which one? If, if, we're gonna, if we're gonna carry this theory all the way out, that the male was created first, so he's the most important, then let's carry it all the way out. Which one is more important, your first child or your second child or your third child or your fourth child, your first wife or your second wife? I'm just talking to a modern church. I'm letting you know that right now. Which one is more important? Because now it doesn't make sense, but this is what we're assigning creation. We've been duped into the idea to think that we, it's a lie that the Bible describes women as less important than men. No, there was just an order to creation and I'm gonna, I'm gonna fill you in on, on why, this is, why this is important. Because there was no part of Adam that went, hey, thanks for giving me somebody weaker. That wasn't what he said. It's almost like he's breathing a sigh of relief. Finally, finally, he gave me what I needed. Finally. Now watch, he created us male and female, okay? Are you still coming back next week? All right, here we go. Many misunderstands God's statement about Adam's condition. Is God missing an aspect of creation? We've talked about this. What he's saying is, I need to make Eve so you and Eve can accomplish my will on the earth. And neither of you can do it independently of each other. Neither of you can do it independently. So if it's to be fruitful and multiply, Adam's going, 
And if he'd have created Eve first, she'd have been in the same boat. By myself, I can't make it. So he tells Adam, I'm gonna make you a helper. Now, in modern English, helper, we've been taught that helper is, is, like, is like a denigrating statement. Oh, you're my helper. It's not true. Do you realize God himself describes himself as a helper to us? He does it all through, throughout scripture. He's our, he's our help. Exodus 18.4, early on. Exodus 18.4 describes as Israel's helper. Deuteronomy 33.7 described as Israel's helper. God is describing Eve just like he would later on describe himself. I'm helping Israel do something that they can't accomplish on their own. So listen, man, when he gives us women in the original creation, he's saying, you can't accomplish my will on your own. I'm giving you somebody to work with and together you will be able to do what I've asked you to do. That's a good thing, right? So which one is more important? Oh, but we've been told, we've been told the problem with marriage is, is is that, we're, is that men have privilege. We've been told the problem with marriage is that it's a male dominated, that you know, masculine, toxic masculine, that's what we've been taught. That's the problem with marriage. And, and the problem with marriage is that women get pushed down and, and they're disrespected. And what has happened since the sexual revolution is we've been taught men don't need women and especially women do not ever need a man. Come on, can we be honest? That's what we've been taught. And we've been taught that we are indeed the same. We've been taught that we are indeed the same. That men can do whatever women can do and women can do whatever men can do. That's not the creation story. God was telling both of them, you can't accomplish what I set you on the earth here to do with another one that looks like you. Did you hear that? God told Adam, if I made another one that looked like you, it wouldn't work. I need to make you somebody that is complimentary to you. God said, I don't need two tough guys. Think about it, come on. I don't need two tough guys. I don't need two guys that can split wood. I need somebody that can split wood and I need somebody that can have kids. Oh, now which one's more important? They're equally important. The order of creation doesn't equal importance. It equals purpose. It equals job description. It just equals you name the things and this is your role over here, Eve. It doesn't mean, it doesn't mean she's less. It doesn't mean that she's, that she's not as important. It means that she's doing what Adam cannot do. Doesn't this seem just elementary when you talk about it this way? But if you turn the TV on, if you go to YouTube, TikTok, anywhere you wanna go, you will find today telling you that this is the dumbest idea that's ever been come up with. But I'm telling you right now, it's God's original design where the most success happens. Amen? All right, look at your neighbor. Say, I'm thankful for your, you're a woman. I mean, if they are a woman, tell them that you're thankful that they're a woman. I can't believe I gotta clarify that. If they're a man, look at them, say, I'm thankful that you're a man. Tell them, I'm thankful that you're a man. I'm thankful that you're a big old stinky hairy man. Tell them that. And I'm thankful, now look at the woman and tell them I'm thankful that you're not stinky and hairy and I'm, I'm thankful that you're not. This foundational aspect of marriage has been lost today. We've been taught, we've been taught that men are deadbeats and that women can raise kids without men. That's what we've been taught for 40 years. We've also been taught that two men can raise babies. We've also been taught that two women can raise babies. 
We've been taught all these things. And listen, the heart of a pastor is, listen, I want people to understand God's original intent because there's freedom in it. In a beautiful marriage of a husband and a wife, I get to be me and she gets to be her. And it's God's intent. And what we have done is we have thrown it all out. We've devalued human life. We've devalued the sanctity of being created in the image of God. We've devalued the way God set it up. And we put erroneous and misleading and absolute lies about about misogynists and feminism and how they're beautiful and how one's horrible and one's the best. And, and we just created our own narrative about, about, well, the Bible talks about this toxic masculine. And what are we getting for it? We're getting a rate of violence from our kids that has never been seen before in this country. And we'll dive into this uh, as we continue this conversation. We're having young men grow up that have no idea what it looks like to be a man. And I can tell you, listen to me, I can tell you right now, I don't know what your circumstance is. And I pray to God, if you're in a difficult circumstance, reach out, get help. Don't, don't try to do it by yourself. I know the world's telling you, listen, mothers, I know the world's telling you, you don't need anybody else. You could do this on your own, but it's proving out that men need men to raise them. There's nothing wrong with reaching out to, a, to a, a guy in the church and saying, hey, listen, I need an example for my son. We're raising a fatherless generation that is recoiling from the effects. And we are locking them up as fast as we can. And so we bought into the lie and we're filling our prisons with the results. And it's, it's unsustainable. It's unsustainable. We can't keep going in this direction. God's painting the picture that two different people become one flesh. It was in a physical act. Obviously, men and women are created differently. To enjoy each other and to procreate. But it was also that we could accomplish the will of God. I keep going back to that. That we can, that listen, there's certain times where men need to be tough and certain times that women need to be caring. And our kids need both of those things. Our culture needs both of those things, amen? Our culture needs kindness and our culture needs toughness all at the same time. Genesis 2, chapter 24, or chapter two, verse 24, stand your feet, we'll end with this. God created a husband and a wife, male and female. And then he said, I want you to be an exclusive family unit. I want you to go off and do this, the two of you. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. It's good that your kids leave and start their own thing. It's like God's design. It's good. This is a picture of two that are created equal in the image of God with distinct differences and roles joining together to establish an exclusive permanent relationship. Now think about that. It's not just married because we're love. No, we're so in love. No, it's that two different Two different people are coming together with different, different abilities and different skill sets and different mindsets and different, all those things. And he's putting God's original design, he puts us together and he says, now you can do all that I've asked you to do. Now you can fulfill the will of God together. That's the way he set it up. 
He told Adam to hold fast to his wife. Now, I wanna clear this up right now. I believe in male leadership of the home. Now, I know that's 1950. I know, I know it's 1950, but I need you to understand this because we've been taught that male leadership of the home is toxic. That's what we've been taught. Turn the TV on, the male's the dumbest person. How could we ever leave him in charge? Amen? But that's scripture. What happens is we let society define what male leadership look like. And we let them tell us that it meant domineering. We let them tell us that it meant you're never gonna get what you want. It meant telling them that he's gonna go out and buy a boat and stay fishing all, all the time. It's not, she was okay with it. Here's what it means. Every man in the room, listen to me. If you're domineering your wife right now, stop it. That wasn't God's design. He created you first to lead her like Christ would lead the church. So now you fast forward from Genesis chapter two all the way to Ephesians chapter five and Paul writes this. Wives, submit to your husbands as a, as a church submits to Christ's leadership. Do you know what? The church has no problem submitting to Christ's leadership because it's perfect. So now he says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church, giving up his very life for her. Now lean into me a second, ladies. Listen to me. God's intent for your husband is to serve you like Christ served the church. He laid his life down for her. He laid his life down for the church. He showed her the right way to go. He gave, he, he, he said, this is the, this is the path. This is the, this is the best way. And so his intent for marriage is yes, that the husband would lead the family to Jesus. The husband would lead the family to God. The husband would learn to lead like Christ led the church. And I'm thinking who wouldn't want that? That's not domineering. That is cherishing and raising up. My goal for my family is that my wife and every one of my kids fulfill the will of God in their lives. And God's gonna hold me responsible for creating the platform by which they can do that. Did you just hear what I said? Male leadership creates the platform for your wife and kids to succeed in the will of God. That's how God called us to lead, not how they're telling us today. You were created to step out front and say, hey, listen, I'm gonna knock down the weeds, I'm gonna prepare the path so that everyone I'm responsible for makes it. That's how God called men to lead. Anything else is not the way God called us to do it. So when we present it God's way, it creates less controversy. It creates less problems because God's original plan was always the best. So I'm praying that over you today. Every man in the house, every female in the house, every husband, every wife, every person in the room understanding how valuable your life is, how perfectly God set this thing up at the beginning and how screwy we've made it so many years later. And it's the church's responsibility to move back, to move back into obedience to his plan for us, amen? I want your families to succeed. And it starts by doing this alignment. Father, we thank you this morning. We thank you that you did not hold your perfect will from us, but you laid it out over and over and over again in your word. So we go back to it. And Lord, we pray that you'd help us apply it to our lives. Apply it today and tomorrow and the next day. And I pray specifically, Lord, that you'd raise up men in this church to lead like Christ, to lead their families. I pray that you'd raise up families, God, that know what it's like to hold different roles and embrace them according to your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Come on, can you give him thanks this morning? Amen. Hey, listen, encourage somebody on the way out. And let's do that this week.